Hi there. This is the beginning of a new season, and I will make a renewed request that you head over to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. That is uh, the primary way that uh, this network, this show, and myself are supported. Uh, it's super easy. Um, you don't have to give very much to make a big difference for us. Uh, yeah, that's patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. <laughs> Welcome to Radio Free Midworld, a podcast about the Dark Tower series of books. I'm your host, Cole Ross, and today I am joined by Zach Johnson. Hey, Zach. Hey, Cole. How's it going? It's going great. I'm super happy to have you here. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, glad to make it. It's uh, It's been a while. I, I was busy for a couple of years, but yeah. now my schedule's a little more open. Yeah, and we're also recording on a bed. We're not recording on the same night where you do your other show. That's true. <laughs> Yeah. No, Zach is uh so you were here, I think the last time you guessed it was the Eyes of the Dragon episode, if I'm yeah. remembering correctly. Yeah. Um, but you know, people who are listening may know you from Video Games Hot Dog, from Kingdom of Loathing, from West of Loathing, all of that. Yeah, I think uh the Eyes of the Dragon show is probably the thing that I'm the most known for. <laughs> in this in, in this show, yes. Yeah. Um Yeah, I was I was excited about this one in particular too, because it for whatever reason I mean, I guess there was like the nine year gap between the Wastelands and Wizard and Glass. And in that, that was prime book rereading age for mm -hmm. me. And so I've, I am so much more familiar with the first four books in the series than I am the last three. Okay. And uh, I really welcomed the opportunity to, to get to reread. Yeah. Nice. So um, what was your first impression of the Wolves of the Kala when you, uh, when you read it back kind of the first time? I, if you had asked me a week ago what it was about, I would have said, I think it was kind of like a little side story where they just remake the Magnificent Seven, <laughs> uh, but that I didn't totally remember it. I, I wasn't sure at what point the like the like weird, big, controversial turn happens. Uh, it seems like it's starting to get hinted at in this. I uh, Yeah. It's uh, I wish I remembered more about the entire book so that I uh, so that I can avoid just idle speculation that accidentally spoils or doesn't spoil things. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that, that, that's good. I, so it's it's always nice to hear people's impressions just because I read all of these kind of in one go back to back to back. So I have no I have no kind of reckon on what the what the weight was like. Right. I was at the time, at least I was a little disappointed that Wizard and Glass was just one big, huge callback and so i enjoyed there being an entire book that took place in the sort of present day with with roland and the crew yeah yeah getting to see like especially at Ad eddie in uh in, in full swing you know yeah yeah um so this came out in 2003 and it's the beginning of this kind of final trilogy uh for the series i'm calling it that and i've heard it i've seen it called that elsewhere because while the other books were kind of <laughs> done whenever Stephen King decided to do them, they weren't really planned together. He took a couple of turns. All of these were kind of planned together and released within a short window. It's a little bit ridiculous reading the prologue for this and saying, like, yeah, this is coming out in 2003. And then, like, the final two books will be out in 2004. <laughs> yeah, having having had such big gaps. I mean, it, the impression that I had at the time, at least, was... You know, he, he had had fans starting to say, hey, I'm worried that you're not going to finish these books before I die. And then when he was almost killed in a car crash, he began to worry that he was not going to finish them before he died. And right. so, uh, I don't know, could, it seems like really just sort of cranked them out. Yep. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I know that there was there was certainly the impression at the time that the quality suffered as a result of it. I'm I'm kind of interested to, to come back to it with a with some more years of perspective and see. Because I, I was just deeply, deeply enamored with The Wasteland. Yeah. And so it was all kind of downhill from there for me the first time around. So right. Especially, I'm sort of curious. I, <laughs> Especially after the, the, the kind of uneventful, not uneventful, but the but the strange, unexpected intermission that didn't pick up from where that Yeah, off, it was right? like the, the, we ended on a cliffhanger and then... Uh, the the resolution of the cliffhanger was by the way look over there and then uh, just barely barely get off the cliff at the very end of that one so <laughs> yeah. yeah 
Uh, so like the other novels, this one has a subtitle that begins with R. This is Resistance. And tellingly, it even has a quote from Steve McQueen at the very uh, at the very beginning. Uh, was it uh, We Deal in Lead? Something like that. So if by the end of this prologue, you don't know that this is going to be a Magnificent Seven riff. Um I like we just we just we need to say that spoilers are weird in this. Yeah, the the gunslingers get hired to uh, to defend the town from marauders, but it's significantly weirder than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about this prologue because <laughs> uh, again, waiting for them to get to the fireworks factory, we're back from Wizard and Glass, and I just wanna I just wanna hear Eddie Wisecrack. We open up with a really lengthy uh, prologue about Caliber and Sturgis, right? Um, and specifically about this one field, son of a bitch. So good. <laughs> so, so as, as, as canny and as smart as Tion Jaffords, kind of the, 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 the viewpoint character for this section is, it is ridiculous that he is still trying to do this, that he's still trying to get like anything out of a patch of land called son of a bitch. Right. Yep. Generations long curse on this field to not grow anything except devil grass <laughs> yep. as, a, as a minor callback. But um, yeah, uh, that, that, that stuff will grow. The trick is keeping it out. Yeah. No. But he's, uh, he's and doing... it's, it seems like he does have the best equipment and, uh, and the, the right tool for the job, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Like, it, and this is the, like, this is shocking to see at the, at the start because, you know, he's plowing this field and, you know, going along, sweating, cursing, et cetera. Uh, but instead of having a, you know, like a, like a donkey or whatever, it's his twin sister, Tia, who's pulling the plow and Tia is root. Yeah. Is that a real word? Um, so the, the, the thing that is underlined in book six, especially when they, I mean, spoilers for that, they end up traveling in book six takes place mostly in our world. Uh, they travel to Maine. The thing you need to understand about Caliber and Sturgis and a lot of the made up language or dialect for this is that it is all, um, it is all kind of based on a Northeastern, like rural Maine kind of accent. So runt is just their way of saying ruined. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, that was like I gathered that from from context, but I was just curious whether that word with Stephen King, you never know. Right. Because right. sometimes there'll be a word that he just suddenly uses without introduction a hundred times in one book. And it turns <laughs> out he made it up or it just means something else or. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I think that I think that literally it's like uh, it's like in the Midwest. We we say roof instead of r roof. Right. Yeah. That might be might be one of those things. Um, but yeah, uh, when somebody is r root, like the, like the, the idea is that this town, it is full of twins. Like they are, there's something about it where it has been engineered, where most families, when they have kids, they have twins. Singletons are these kind of, uh, uh, I have no idea if singleton is actually what you call like a, like an only child or somebody born just once, but singletons are kind of coveted, right? Like there, it is always the talk of the town when somebody has just one kid because every generation or so these things these beings called the wolves descend on caliber and sturgis take the kids away and then they're sent back runes which means that they come back intellectually disabled and also physically mutated you know even though tia and tian are twins um tia is about a foot taller than tian like they, they 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 grow to gigantic size and basically are incomplete. Something is taken from them. And I don't know if it's spelled out. Do they always end up larger and sort of galoot like, or is that just something that happens to some of them? Uh, universally, yeah. They they, they come okay. back. They also mature like a lot faster as well. And they live and they live. I, I believe they live shorter lives as well. Something like that. There's there's a lot of like sort of weird foreshadowing about what happens here, and it's like, do are they do they take all of the kids and half of them come back normal <laughs> and half of them come back bad, or and it's like it seems like nope, they just take one and then they always send them back all screwed up like this. Yeah, and like that becomes that becomes part of the bargaining later on in the in the town meeting, but the town meeting isn't called until we're introduced to Andy. Zach, I want to hear your opinions on Andy. <laughs> oh, Andy's so good. Uh, <laughs> I, these are the things that I like the most about this series is the the weird sort of personal like 
the part of the wastelands where Blaine is just demoing the sort of consumer technology that was available mm -hmm. at the height of this civilization was just one of my favorite things about the world. And Andy is very much a, a function of that. And also, it just seems like he looks like a it's like a cartoon robot. Like I can't actually the way that this robot is described, which is like a barrel shaped head, a barrel for a body and then just long spindly tube arms. <laughs> I can't. I can't see this as an actual physical object. I can only see it as a drawing. <laughs> yeah. It's um I think there are a couple of illustrations in one of the versions of the book that don't match with the picture that I have in my head. So he acts like C3PO and the tendency would be just a picture of C3PO here. Um however he's far lankier, like he's 7 feet tall and the barrel like description you, you've seen Futurama, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I always picture him as like a more sinister looking malfunctioning Eddie. The, uh, Which one is Eddie? Malfunctioning Eddie is the car. It's a, he's the uh, the car dealership, uh, uh, the the car dealing robot who instead of saying like, "Oh, my prices are so low, I must be insane," he uh, <laughs> my 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 prices are so low, I must be malfunctioning, and he explodes at the uh, at the slightest provocation. Gotcha. Yeah. When Fry is sent to the uh, to the robot insane asylum, Eddie is his first roommate. Uh, yeah. It has a very like sort of 50s seeming aesthetic applied to it <laughs> in, in the way that I see it, at least like it's like a like an early science fiction movie kind of robot. That's just like a sort of loosely based like based on a humanoid form that's made out of like <laughs> common objects. Like right. the head is shaped like a bucket because like, well, we understand what a bucket is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the body is shaped like a garbage can because that's what we can fit around a grown ass man. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Andy is physically imposing, but also he is uh, an annoying busybody that everybody in Caliber and Sturgis barely tolerates. Uh, except the old man, where it's alluded that the old man listens to Andy with great attention. Yeah, and I think you, you, it's. It's suggested there that the old man is some sort of clergyman, uh, based on based on Tian's first description of him. Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna get to meet him. That is a that, that is a badass reveal. Yeah, uh, when they when 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 they bring him out. But Andy, uh, if if he if he knows two things, it is horoscopes and knowing when the wolves are gonna come. <laughs> right. Occasional songs too, but uh, yeah, mostly mostly just horoscopes and omens of impending d doom. <laughs> yeah, and the calling of all of the children. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, I also love uh like as he's processing you can hear a click from inside him, like uh like when Blaine is uh uh talking uh, or thinking. Um he is made by North Central Positronics. I cannot remember if I if I mentioned that. Um, and also the music is described as coming from his chest and the singing is coming from his voice. And the music is almost always this like very reedy piano. <laughs> it's like hilarious to think about the, the technology that would have to exist for Blaine to be able to work the way that he does mm -hmm. and for this robot to be able to work the way that it does. But it makes audible clicking noises when it <laughs> functions as though it were just like. Oh, this is actually just a really complicated typewriter uh, <laughs> that we've that we've given the ability to talk. Yeah, like um, I imagine, like a record player spinning up inside him, or a tape loop, or something when yeah. it, when it describes the way the song is starting, or like when a hard drive is failing, you know, when yeah. the, and the and the seek head hits up against the side. Yeah, S some something like that. He is uh, he he is certainly. Uh, uh, he's bad news, and he's been around, you know, for basically as long as the Cala can remember, and nobody can figure out why he is still functioning. Um, but so he comes and gives this unwelcome news, and this kind of sends Tian like off the edge a little bit, you know, saying like, "Hey, you know, this this time we're gonna fight." The other piece of news is that there are strangers coming from the north, uh, from the northwest along the path of the beam. Yeah. Right. Tian doesn't Tian doesn't really care about that. No, at least in this chapter. <laughs> no, Which that felt that felt a little weird. I'm like, what is this guy's motivation exactly? If uh, he just like, I mean, understandably, he is upset that this thing he's been dreading for his entire life is about to happen, which is mm -hmm. going to involve basically the destruction of two of his children. Yes. Yeah. Because he has two sets That's of twins. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And he has one uh, one single child. And that sort of makes you the subject of a lot of envy in this community because the wolves don't take single children. Right. Right. So in this, in the single kid, when we see him, he's a little bit of, he's a little bit of a monster. 
<laughs> like a little bit of a piece of shit in terms of just being uh kind of out of control. You get the sense that single single children are, you know, they they they, they don't run the joint, but they get a little bit more uh, lax treatment. <clears throat> yeah, they get ruined. They get ruined in another way. Just <laughs> yeah. like they get spoilt. Yes, they get spoilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tian calls the meeting here um, at the town pavilion, and his. His motivation is he's like, hey, you know, every, you know, 25 years or so, these things come and take half of our kids, give or take. Um, and we just let them happen. You know, we just let this happen. We we need to fight back. Right. And he's got, you know, some canny political po <laughs> political uh, movement going on here because his uh, his strategy is, OK, let's let everybody talk about these options that are obviously not feasible. And then, and then, you know, the fighting will be the only option that's left. Right. Right. Like asking your mom if you can have a flamethrower so that when she <laughs> says no, you can ask if you can have a BB gun and she'll say yes. Yeah, if you got to leave a little bit of room to negotiate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ask the, for the stars and get the moon. <laughs> and the, the Manny, the, this is a sort of a Christian sect that was like rewritten back into the revised edition of the gunslinger after appearing more in these, in the later books. Yeah. What do we what do we what do we know about them at this point? They they just seem like sort of monks except also just normal people. Yeah. So so the, so the Manny uh they were also uh written in a little bit around Vane and also Gabrielle. Uh they're a little bit like uh like nom think nomadic Amish a little bit. Gotcha. Um and they are they 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 are Christian but there's more of like a mysticism to it. Um, you know, Van A being associated with the Manny kind of implies that they deal a lot with the idea of going to dash. They go, they deal a lot with, um, you know, the kind of parallel nature of the world in, in, in mid world. And they're, kind of they're more, more aware of the existence of multiple levels of the tower. Yes. Yeah. They, 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 they're keyed into the metaphysics, but also, you know, <laughs> they're, they're distrusted because they are nomadic. Right. Yeah. Right. Like G Gabrielle, I think she came from a family a family of Mani, uh, as uh, as well, and that's that that's a little bit why she had kind of minor minor visions and was troubled troubled by like possession and things like that. Hmm. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the Mani are here and they're going full on psychopath. They're calling back to the ancient, far off, probably made up land of Egypt. Um, saying, Hey, when the plagues came, they took, you know, they, they put lamb's blood on the doors. So maybe that means we kill one of each twin, put the blood on the doors and say, all right, can't take any of you only take twins. Uh, nobody wants that. And they object to it by saying, well, why don't we just all kill ourselves and kill our children? And the nanny say, yeah, you know, that's also an option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Te te technically correct is the best kind <laughs> of correct. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're so, just taking the the Heath Ledger's Joker approach to problem solving here. Which is really nothing's not on the table, right? right you know, blue sky. Right? Let's <sighs> write first, revise later. Um, the other faction here is led by Overholzer. Uh, I want to say Wayne Over Over uh, Overholzer, but he is, I think, an actual writer. I forget this this Overholzer though. He is. It's a big old fat guy who is the most successful farmer who people semi like just kind of like revere to his face because he can ruin them, but kind of hate because all of his kids are singletons and they're they're aged out of this anyway. And he is lobbying for the status quo. He says, hey, we give half so the village can go on like this has worked forever. What you know, why don't we just let it happen? Yeah, and it seems like they, this the the people who are in the position of the most extreme privilege here are the ones that are the most okay with, you know, the poorer people being disproportionately affected by the, the policies of the current administration <laughs> coming out of thunderclap. Uh, and so yeah. you got, you so got, they, you, you got to love the fantastical world building. Where does Stephen King get this? Yeah. yeah I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically the rich people are like, yeah, he's, he's right. You know, this is, this is working for us so mm -hmm. far. Like, yeah. let's just let this, let's just let this keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, Tian kind of makes this uh, makes an analogy saying like, hey, even the strongest tree, if you start cutting away at the at the heartwood over and over again, it'll die. 
like you know the, the, it's basically a setup oh we're like livestock or we're like hunting stock you know we're we're, we're drawn down every single time when we can't actually move forward we're just subsisting here right and even you get the sense that even if things were good it's 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 good in the way that it was good in that one place in watership down where <laughs> you know or like with, with like you know the morlocks only come every once in a while so <laughs> yeah. i guess we're gonna be all right yeah basically this is like weather for for, for them um, the, the third faction though is, is, uh, uh, Jaffords himself and he is supported by Pear Callahan. That name is familiar. He is the old man. He arrives in the back kind of late and sticks around until he notices, you know, until he knows the time to go in. Uh, he talks, he talks street jive, um, works in the slang, uh, of, of both this area and his world because this is Father Callahan from Salem's Lot. And he says, yes, we are going to fight. Yeah, in his weird modern day Boston slang. <laughs> this is chicken shit. He he calls everybody's plans to give up chicken shit, and nobody <laughs> understands it. But also, nobody wants to question him on it. It's sad to me that a that an entire language would develop without, uh, you know, that was close enough to English that we could understand it, but that didn't have the word chicken shit. I know. It's real. There's so many. What you can't describe speeding tickets. <laughs> you know, you can't. <laughs> You can't describe the policies at retail stores. It's oh, geez, just very, uh, well, very maybe, handicapped. I, I forget. I don't know if they actually have chickens in Midworld or if they call them something different. Like I'm about to say pookies, but that's what they call big snakes. Or um, a popen a popenax. <laughs> yep, yep. A po popenax shit. Yeah. Is that is that is it ever described? I forget if opopenax comes up anywhere else. They describe the feather that he's carrying as an opopenax feather. And I looked up Opopanax, and it's like a medicinal tree resin, like myrrh. Huh. Oh, you mean the talking feather that they're passing around? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I have no idea. I didn't. I I didn't think to go look that up. I don't think it comes up again. I can do yes. a. <laughs> I can I can do a search in my Kindle version. Huh. It's a good. Uh. It's it's a good name for something. Opop. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it, it doesn't even like. I, w sometimes when I Google something from one of these books, like, okay, obviously the first result here is like some Dark Tower wiki. Right, right. But that just like passes without comment uh, from anyone on the internet. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, like nobody nobody is saying like, what does this derive from? Yeah, it's all it's it's all from this. Yeah. Oh, there is one in the there is one in the Dark Tower wiki. Okay. It definitely is just some kind of uh, in, in the real world. It is just some kind of like a uh, uh, extract kind of thing weird okay it shows up in black house again too the the uh sequel to the talisman oh okay uh, and and the 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 character is like obsessed with the word hmm. describing a word a word that cannot be found in the dictionary is what its meaning is described as but that's no it's in there and it's myrrh <laughs> like <laughs> yeah oh weird huh and also this is an urban dictionary I'll, I'll try to edit this so it's not ju just us reading the uh... right, right, just googling stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, but it's uh, it, it is a good word, huh? Um, but yes, uh, Father Callahan calls this chicken shit. Uh, again, uh, just uh, asking for your first impression of this, or kind of your general impression right now. What do you think of of Callahan getting his second act in a completely unrelated series? I, it's pretty good. You know, it, it's the, when the, when the connections between all of King's other work and these books started happening kind of fast and furious, some of them really worked for me and some of them didn't, mm -hmm. but this was one that felt pretty natural because it yeah. was like, oh yeah, you know, this guy seems like the kind of guy that would go travel between worlds, fight an evil where yeah. it, where it needed it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, having having read um, the Wolves of the Cala before Salem's Lot, it was remarkable, actually, how not how little he factored into Salem to, to the to the older book, but just kind of like, oh, like the, the, there is definitely more of a character here than was used in Salem's yeah. Lot, right? So it's it, it it's good to see him popping up, and like I think even before they, <laughs> he, he's really playing with the re reveal before they even name him Callahan. They talk about the the cross shaped scar in his forehead. The rumor is that he carved it in himself, like a Charles Manson kind of thing, um, and also the scarred hand from touching the uh, from touching the cathedral door. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, it's good stuff. And he comes in and says, all right, well, you know, everybody, everybody is saying, well, even if we do fight, what are we going to do? Like one guy over there thinks he's king shit of Buck Mountain because he has an old rifle and who knows if that even fires. Uh, are we going to use rocks and sticks? Callahan says, well, if we listen to Andy, <laughs> we would know that there are gunslingers coming and we can ask them. Um, and I have no idea. I cannot remember specifically if Callahan is setting up a Magnificent Seven situation or a Seven Samurai situation because of his familiarity with 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 uh, um, media from our world or if this is just another coincidence. Hmm. It does make sense that Callahan would be more interested in Andy, too, because, yes. you know, like us, the readers are like, what is this insane thing that's happening with there being a robot in this <laughs> setting, as opposed to it just being kind of part of the scenery that's always been there? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he knows it doesn't fit. It didn't it didn't come baked in with the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the resolution, you know, they, they arrive at this, well, it's worth, you know, we have a month, it is worth going and talking to them. So they send out a party to track them down very, very ineptly. Yep. <laughs> that takes us to chapter one, the face on the water, which, oh man, we're back with our old friend, Zach. Hooray. <laughs> This is funny in relation to specifically the wind through the keyhole because Eddie is stir crazy that nothing is happening, notwithstanding that crazy story that Roland told them or the ice storm that caused trees to explode around him. <laughs> right. <laughs> and also, you know, we're still in this other world filled with ancient machines. I mean, I guess, you know, walking walking through the woods is boring yeah. you know, eventually, <laughs> like even if it's a fantastic woods that probably have magical sprites and robots in them yeah if you know if you're not seeing them now <laughs> yeah just uh, the, the the promise that they're there is uh it is cold comfort when you're bored but the, you know the idea being that with time being as wishy-washy as it is already um <laughs> boredom on top of that you know just causes Eddie to get to, to get inside his own head right yeah they're really leaning into the world falling apart in sort of more tangible ways in the way that they're describing it here, just directions, changing orientation, and some days just being twice as long as others as opposed to seeming twice as long as others. Yeah, yeah. And just the uh, the kind of sense of dread or insecurity that comes with not knowing if that is a subjective thing or, like, if that's actually what's happening, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing that is coming up that, oh boy, does this presage something that is entirely a thing for at least the, this book and all of the next, uh, everything is coming up 19. They're noticing just that that number, you know, is coming up when they go and get, when they go and gather wood for a fire, it's always 19 pieces, um, et cetera, and down the line to the point where it's become a running joke because they have run bum hug into the ground. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, and they, they, they do it on purpose, and they also do it by accident, and they find a tree whose branches are twisted into the number 19. Uh -huh. I mean, presumably just from one angle. Um, <laughs> right, it's like a little bit like, which... a, like a shadow sculpture. Right. <laughs> um, and they pass the time by telling fairy tales. You know, this is something they, that they had done the entire time. I only make a note of this, um, A, because Roland is getting you know, opening up far more, but Roland also... Uh, acts as a bit of an author stand-in for this and basically lays out a thesis for, if not the entire series, uh, this back half saying like, you know, he can't understand the idea of genre, right? You know, Eddie and Susanna, they're saying like, yeah, stories fit into a box. It's either sci-fi, fairy tale, et cetera, et cetera. Roland says, and so every story has to be in one box at the same time. Do people always want one flavor at a time in your world? Does no one eat stew? <laughs> Which and, and weirdly, like stew is a thing that it like takes a whole bunch of stuff and sort of reduces them to one flavor. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know that that's the when I think of like a big variety, like you know, does nobody want crudite or something, right? Like, yeah. exactly. that, 
<laughs> yeah, so Stu is definitely, and, and <laughs> maybe there is a point in that that just kind of like, oh, there, like there, there is a synthesis of something new from all these different parts, but it definitely right. doesn't get at the variety. Like, well, <laughs> what, what, what if everything was savory in the end? Oh, okay, right, yeah, yeah. These potatoes kind of taste like meat, and this meat kind of tastes like potatoes. <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's it's like a, a, he he criticizes genre restrictions you know as though the idea of a, a western with fantasy and sci-fi elements was uh was so out of line with anything that anybody on earth would enjoy <laughs> yeah which uh it seems like he's making an argument against somebody who doesn't exist if king is using that to <laughs> to to comment on his own work uh thus far yeah. with the series. like did stephen king get on twitter right before he read this <laughs> or wrote this <laughs> <laughs> all right let's let's work in a take that like right. if, if that is specifically like a haha like the, the <laughs> your criticism of me was impermanent but my my rebuttal is forever like getting in there and you, you know doing a take that to somebody who talked about the dark tower that's some michael Crichton shit <laughs> yeah or like or like sort of a little bit of late jk rowling too like oh, after yeah. <laughs> in the later books where it's like you know she basically she describes something like Right. You know, you know, because as everybody knows, wizards are forbidden from creating money, Jeff. And then it just moves on. Like, what? That was weird. What? Yeah. So it sticks out uh, kind of like a sore thumb because it does feel like he is commenting, commenting uh, as himself in the in the book. But who knows it's also just not the sort of thing that roland the character that we know would care about very much it doesn't seem like yeah he, he's he's weirdly obsessed with story though right like, I guess that is like even even right here you know there, there there's a little bit of a line just about yeah, there's a, like a bit of a reversal um where roland listens intently and you know kind of looks at these stories as though he was an anthropologist trying to learn about uh eddie and Susanna's world whereas they kind of take everything that roland says at face value without doing that i think that i think that maybe what they're building into this you, you know again because a large part of this back trilogy is about kind of the the transportative power of story right yeah uh, they're, they're they're trying to set up some kind of thesis that he he is fixated on this yeah. yeah yeah it doesn't match the role that we saw in book one or two but like you can see how maybe it follows from four yeah i guess that's true i mean as i and i still like because of my particular traversal of the series i am kind of stuck in the first three books Absolutely. in terms of a lot of the characterizations yeah but um at this point, the the, the party is running kind of low on food. <laughs> so they find some fantastical fruit that transports them to, to different lands. Uh, the muffin <laughs> balls, uh, which are described as looking like uh, li like little round berries with uh, or big big round berries with double horns on them. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Roland Roland says they're not mushrooms. Uh, they're they're like uh, they're like a ground berry. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a phrase. I, <laughs> it sounds like a yeah. euphemism for animal crap. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess that's true. Like a road apple. Uh, yeah, horse yeah. apples. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Roland, Roland helpfully warns them after they've all already eaten a bunch of them. So, <laughs> by the way. Get weird. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have real weird dreams. Like, thanks. Thanks, man. <laughs> well, well Jake, Jake freaks out because he knows that Roland takes mescaline like it's nothing. Right. Like, like he, he's worried that he's going to start tripping like his dad did because his dad was, you know, way, way, way into his drugs. <laughs> yeah, it seemed, like a, it seemed like the right time to be like a big cocaine and quaaludes enthusiast. Oh, yeah. Late, late, late 70s corporate culture. Yeah. Yeah. His Coca-Cola. Um, yeah, but uh, and and it turns out uh, when he says their dreams are going to be weird, he is not kidding. No, um, I, I'd, so <laughs> he, he said they're going to be weird. I think maybe he thought it was going to be like, oh, upset tummy, spicy food dreams. They didn't count on the fact that, well, Father Callahan has something in his house that is waking up that uh, is going to draw uh, draw uh, susceptible people into different worlds. This takes us to chapter two, the New York Groove, where Jake, Eddie, and Noy have such a vivid dream they share it caribbean queen uh where they are all pretty much physically in new york uh on the particular day when jake left home following jake 77's trail 
<laughs> yeah, I, I like that they're referring to the 1977 native uh, version of Jake as Jake 77. <laughs> just to, just like, to clarify, it's <laughs> yeah, that's just. That was his. That was his handle on the early BBSs. Yeah, <laughs> so. it's, it's like marking one twin with a piece of chalk, so you know which one they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is really cool. So they have gone to dash. We've referred to this a little bit. Um, this is the first kind of formal introduction of the of the of the phenomenon. But basically, they have shifted from one level of the tower into kind of a semi real version of the other. Um, and the barriers between them and the, you know, <laughs> writhing chaos of monsters, uh, that are in the space between the different levels is very, very thin. Um, and also this trip is accompanied by chimes that, uh, are a little bit like being near a thinny, right? None of them know yeah. this so far right now, uh, but they are physically somewhere else back where they were in Midworld, uh, or end world were rather. Um, there is just a shimmering gray fog in their form, kind of keeping their place. Yeah, that was very upsetting. <laughs> well, 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 what specifically? The, just the idea of that placeholder being there, representing that they are in this incredibly treacherous situation mm -hmm. that that is horrifying to think about and that just no one can do anything about. Yeah. <laughs> well, Roland even says later on, like, okay, I could try to wake them up. But who knows what that would sever? Right, right. Like you just—he only half remembers the lesson that Vane taught him. Like just the to think about just being strands, <laughs> being stranded as the walls fall down around the kind of the the, the toad ash dimension that you're in, and basically the mist happens to you, except that it happens over the course of maybe two minutes, <laughs> and the tentacles come right. and grab you. Yeah, it's a uh, <laughs> very precarious. But they're back, and they follow Jake seventy seven to uh, the New York restaurant of the mind. Uh, headed up by our good friend, the hapless and venal Calvin Tower, uh, and also his buddy Aaron Deepnow, relative of uh, Ed Deepnow, the guy who goes crazy in insomnia. Um, yeah, and they're kind of watching this all play out. Jake realizes something is different, and it sticks out like a sore thumb to us because on the sign outside of the diner, where it says, oh, now serve today, pan-fried Faulkner and hard-boiled Chandler. Um, it offers chilled Stephen King from Maine. And we were all chilled by the sudden author insertion. <laughs> um, I, you know, you could hear a lot of people getting upset on the internet all at once at the first inklings of it. Because this is sort of the first time that happens at all, right? It's the first time that it happens in the series, uh, and also the first time I think maybe that it happens in a uh, in a Stephen King authored book. He, he he did that. So at the end of the Regulators, the you know the one of the Bachman books, it refers to Stephen King's The Shining. Um, right. Ad additionally, also remember back in book number two when Eddie is looking through the uh is looking through Susanna's door the second door and he sees how smooth the motion is he calls out the similarity between that and scenes that he saw in the shining as well right okay that's right although i i took that to mean Stephen King distancing himself from the good version of the the movie <laughs> of the shining to the point where he pretended that he didn't need to maintain any kind of continuity. <laughs> yeah. like, well, no, that wasn't me. There's no reason that wouldn't exist in a world that I wasn't there. Yeah, that's not based right. on the book that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, <That's... laughs> yeah, that, that that is definitely possible. Uh, so I'll plant this flag in the ground, I guess. The author inserts insert stuff doesn't bother me. Maybe because I have, I don't know, maybe a tolerance and a slight affinity for meta wankiness. Yeah, it never bothered me either. Like, none yeah. of the things that upset people about this series as it went on, while I agree that the overall level of of quality and wonder never really reached the point that it was in the Wastelands, mm -hmm. I, it was fine. Everything yeah. about it was fine, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if people, I guess I say, like, if people are looking for, looking for, like, you know, uh, gnashing of teeth and rending of garments about specifically when it gets turned up to 11, I think in book number six, I forget if it happens in book five. Um, they're not going to find it from me, maybe from another guest, but yeah, not here. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Jake doesn't call it out specifically, but there was no mention of Stephen King. The thing that he does notice is that the a version of Charlie the Choo Choo that uh that Jake is Jake seventy seven is holding up, uh has a different author, uh, a different author named Claudia E. Naz Bachman, 
19 letters in that name. Um, and uh, as opposed to what Beryl Evans, I think is the original. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Was that, I never actually looked into this. Was that Beryl Evans book, a real book? Charlie, the Choo Choo. I know. Yeah. Well, it was, it was made like th- th- somebody printed it after this, if not. Right. But it's like a feely for the Dark Tower series, right? Not, yeah. not an actual children's book that Blaine was somehow based on. Right, right. It was, uh, it was made up for the series. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Beryl, I, I never, I never did a Google search for this. Beryl Evans is an actress, actually, hmm. uh, but an Australian actress, I believe, and also a politician. Huh. Weird. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was, uh, that that was made up. Um, it is again, notable that the new author, you know, the alternate universe version is Bachman. It's a little bit of a, a little bit of an inside joke, a wink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they see this and Jake wants to continue to go to the lot with the Rose because, Hey, everything is good there. Uh, despite the fact that basically this entire thing is shot day for night. Like things are unreal. They can walk through doors. Uh, even though it is, you know, they can tell that it is, you know, the middle of the day outside, there's kind of like a tangible darkness around everything. Eddie says, no, I think that we were brought here to see what happened after, you know, he just has a gut feeling and they stick around and guess who shows up? Our good old friends, (laughs) Enrico Balazar and Jack Andalini, uh, good old fashioned crime bosses showing up to shake down Calvin tower. Yeah. And very, uh, very right out of a movie yeah. kind of scene. <laughs> yep. there, there, there is no, there is no free time between notable, uh, notable events, right? No. Um, yeah. There's also a kind of a canny retcon that they do, or that King does in the opening of this book. I don't know if you noticed this. Never before in the series is it said that the person who was driving the car that hit, um, let's say, <laughs> let's say Jake dead. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. Was was Balazar? Yes. Yeah. Right. And they just did. They never said that it was anybody else. Either. Right. I wasn't. I when I got to that point, I was like, huh, did they mention that? Because it's not out of the realm of the kind of coincidence that that whole sequence of events was already shot through with. But right. Uh, right. You know, the, yeah. The, the, the idea that it was it was initially it was initially Walter that Jake saw, but it was actually Jack Mort. Jack Mort also being the person who not only dropped a brick on Detta's head, but uh, also pushed her in front of the train. Yeah. Uh, that was just the, I, and looking back at that, the first time I noticed that it really stuck out was when I was reading the comic, um, adaptation of the drawing of the three and it's specifically called out to be Balazar and like, wait a minute, is that, does that have a basis in anything? No, this is the first time. Um, <laughs> yeah, but they are hired by the Sombra corporation, uh, which is in collaboration with Lemurk industries, which we might recognize from being associated with North Central Positronics. They're being hired to shake down Tower because he owns the lot where Tom and Jerry's artistic deli used to be, where the rose is growing. Uh, there's a complicated uh, kind of contract that they that they have. Calvin Tower is a very bad businessman <laughs> who's throwing money into this into this bookshop, uh, kind of delusionally. Um, but he owns this lot. They paid him a hundred thousand dollars to stop him from selling it while they worked him over, uh, to, to get him to sell it. But he ha- he has an attachment to it because of his family line basically. And does he, do we know, does he have any sense of the importance of that spot or is he just sentimentally attached to it because he's being marionetted by forces he's not aware of? <laughs> uh, I think it's the latter. Uh, yeah. his, his family generally, I think is implied because they are like, you know, going back to the Dutch Torin, I think that they necessarily were, you know, just, uh, coincidentally always in charge of this lot. Uh, Calvin himself is strongly and irrationally sentimentally attached to lots of things. You can see that later on when he starts trying to protect his books over everybody else. Like he is uh, afraid of change and afraid of giving up these things that he covets uh, and people die because of it. Yeah. I didn't get a real, like I did not entirely understand. And maybe, maybe you're not meant to at this point in the story, like what that actual contract was. 
It was like, hey, sell me this lot. No, I'm not going to sell it to anybody. All right, well, I'll give you $100,000 to not sell it to anybody. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I didn't really understand what the deal was because that doesn't seem to make much sense. No, I don't. It, it doesn't make that much sense. I think that I think that almost like 100000 was like a, like a down payment or basically a lien to stop him from putting any, any other liens on it. Um, gotcha. I also don't I don't understand why if the contract was was activated why Balazar or Sombra feel like they have any leverage over him because he because Tower has not necessarily uh, been in breach of the contract right <laughs> right they, we came over here to make you an offer that you were going to accept and then see through to the end uh, <laughs> yeah. but we're mobsters so uh, <laughs> it would be a shame if something happened to it. Um, like, <laughs> Uh, we came over here with an offer you have accepted yeah <laughs> but it's it's pretty funny the way that this works right because because you know jake and eddie and oi are uh todash they're there but not quite um i forget if it's andalini or balazar who like who says like hey is somebody watching us is somebody back here and tower says oh that's just the shop cat <laughs> yeah because while, while they're there in 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 todash form like people are sort of aware of them. Nobody, nobody walks through them. They don't see them, but they, they're getting out of the way of something. Yeah. Like they do. Um, it, it's almost explicitly, I think ripped from, uh, the matrix, right? They're standing in the middle, you know, in the middle of this midtown neighborhood and people are avoiding them. One woman steps over where Oi is, uh, even though she cannot perceive him, you know, like it's like that scene where the, like the entire crowd is bending around Neo. All right. Yeah. Um, and this was written. This was written after that. Yep. <laughs> so why not throw it in it's pop culture that that stuff also doesn't bother me a lot of people are bugged by the re reveal of what the wolves actually are it's it's no. fine it's fine yep <laughs> so um as they are looking at the particulars of this contract though the chimes start up again and eddie's he wants to stick around but he hears henry's voice for the first time in several months um, saying like, hey, you know, like your suspicion that there are monsters beyond that darkness, it's you know, it's real. So you better get you better boogie because uh, because bad news is you know bad bad news is coming. This takes us to chapter three, uh, which is pretty high up there in the terms of just badass imagery in this series. I think. Yeah, it's very upsetting <laughs> <laughs> sequence of things that happen. Yeah. <laughs> because uh Susanna is notably absent from the Todash dream because she is having her own dream. Um and this is alluded to a little bit. Like we knew, I think as far back as maybe the end of the wasteland, uh, that her encounter at the speaking ring left her pregnant. And she's been kind of keeping that from Eddie and everybody else. Well, she has a new passenger as well, not just the chap, um, which is what she calls the baby, but Mia. Uh, throwing a fourth personality into the mix, Mia, which is mother in the high speech. Uh, and Mia's whole goal is to take over Susanna's body and make sure that she gives the baby, the chap, the the, the nourishment that, uh, that the chap needs to turn into what he is. Uh, so the cravings are for vermin and swamp animals. And we have... <laughs> Just the, the the description of the castle that she, that 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 Mia thinks that she's walking around in. I, the, this is an actual place. This is Castle Discordia. When we go there later, but just the the, the blood stained throne and the massive empty banquet hall with you know empty you know, full wine buckets sitting on the table and just and rats rats scurrying around under the under the table, but yeah. but like perfectly appetizing sounding food still uh -huh. there somehow. Yeah. So in Mia's head and kind of the the, the fiction that she has created for you know for, for the body of Susanna's along, like yeah, they are in this magnificently appointed castle you know kind of crawling around having this bank you know, you know doing this banquet um and all of the all of her voices are talking to each other so you have odetta you know talking about you know just uh, how, how, how great morehouse is and you know asking how so and so is doing social light chatter then detta chimes in you know talking about the first special plate you know she's breaking the plates as they're going along she's doing voices like of the people that they're talking to you know just as she's just going going ham on this ham in real life though <laughs> she is stripped nude and is <laughs> swimming around in basically a swamp pond grabbing leeches off of her skin 
Uh, at one point, she s- squeezes a rat until it dies, pops it into her mouth, and then basically pulls out the skeleton and the fur. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> like, oh, also, I'm part owl now. Um, this is... <laughs> Save those pellets. You can sell them to an elementary school <laughs> science class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was like that, you know, even in animals that can do that, I don't think it happens like right away, <laughs> you know? It's, it's like when a cartoon cat eats a fish and pulls the skeleton yeah, and like, like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, she's like, she's grabbing the bugs out of the air around her too. It's, uh, it is, it is really, uh, it, it's really gross. Um, yeah, and Roland's watching the entire time and he, In the first half of the chapter, when it's still being described as this thing happening in this big castle, Roland is also there. He can see her, but she can't see him. And Mm -hmm. it's just weird and not really explained what's going on. Makes sense later when you realize that he's just following her as she sleeps, sleepwalks, sleep feasts through (laughs) this revolting swamp. Yeah. (laughs) And just uh, just just goes in there. And it's the dream just is super effective. You know, especially, you know, when when we're, when we're seeing it in, you know, from Roland's point of view, that she is yelling, yelling at herself in these different voices that couldn't possibly come from the same throat. Right. You know, yeah. you don't just have she, Odetta. You have Detta with her up, upsetting patois uh, thrown into the mix. <laughs> All of that. It's uh, uh, it's very evocative. Yeah, th- this this chapter, get, it, it reminds you of a lot of the, the stuff from earlier in the series where you, you think, well, you know, like Stephen King is a is a right thinking progressive dude, but he really piles on a lot of a lot of his sort of bad old stuff here where yeah. like she's uh, Susanna's they the chapter starts with saying, well, she's Susanna Dean because she took her husband's name. She <laughs> she was around before all the feminist squabbling. It's like, whoa, dude. <laughs> Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, you get, you get Detta Holmes coming back and that's just like, don't, don't do that, please. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it was bad, bad enough in the eighties. This was like, you know, this was almost Obama administration. Like, you can't, <laughs> yeah. you can't do that. No. Yeah. Um, Are you kidding? <laughs> the, the thing that can be said for it is that it does put you off balance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is, it is just another one of the things that's upsetting about this. Yeah, yeah. just added, added onto the pile. Um, yeah, and, and just also the, the just like general sort of problem with the character. Like, this is not how schizophrenia works. Yeah, right. Like, the, this is how it works as a plot device, but that's kind of all that version of it has ever been yeah fortunately like this uh, i I think you said it earlier off off the air like this gets that part of it off like like out of the system a little bit from this point forward you know this this struggle is still still here but it is it is Susanna versus mia which is is kind of removed from a little bit of that right Yeah. yeah yeah and and it does you know and i don't maybe maybe there was some self-awareness to this it also does sort of increase the overall level of discomfort in an already very disturbing chapter yeah um very well done i just i I cannot say enough about the imagery in this um you know especially with you know when we do get to that second half with roland having followed her you know watching as this goes on and kind of thinking all right, well, we are in a terrible situation. Not only have well, has one half of the quartet gone to dash, this thing that I barely remember from elementary school, you know, trying to think back of like, all right, is it, is it capitalized? Like how, like, how do we even talk about this? We have, an, you know, we have another member of the, of the quartet who is like, we know that she's pregnant. If I talk about this, if I raise the issue, you know, Eddie, he argue he he argues like it's breathing. You know, he's going to want to keep the baby because there is <laughs> because there is the slimmest chance that it is his, right? Um, and so just Roland is sitting basically on this powder keg of problems that they need to solve when another problem is gonna be dropped into the into their lap, namely the the the, the wolves and kind of the encroaching forces of the Crimson King that are, you know, kind of uh, tightening around them, right? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, they, they've been like tangentially aware that this group from Calibre and Sturgis has been very clumsily tracking them right. uh, and are choosing to ignore them. And sort of uh, all of the all of the teacher voices in Roland's head are saying things like, you're really going to have to stop thinking about stuff and make some decisions yeah. about a, a variety of situations very soon. Yeah. Um, 
And then he goes to sleep. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) He figures, all right, well, we're not in imminent danger. Those people over there, they're too clumsy to really be of concern to us. Um, My my, my two best friends, uh, you know, my my, my best friend and my apprentice, they are no longer shimmering, shimmering, flickering fog. Uh, And my other friend has, you know, she's cleaned up her, her wheelchair enough. Right. She's no longer in swamp vampire mode. So <laughs> yeah. I, her husband is safe. Yeah. She, she, she comes back full of bug juice. Like, <laughs> and Boy, that's, go ahead. I, you know, uh, of all the things wrong with being pregnant with a demon child, I got to say, like, the ability to eat all of the stuff that she was described as eating and still be able to function, you know, (laughs) to just not be like doubled over with heartburn and diarrhea. Like, (laughs) I, you know, maybe, maybe it would be worth it. Yeah. Well, she, she, she holds up the parasite. She looks it in the eye and says, uh, I'm not in here with you. You're in here with me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, just, uh, it goes around. She's like a sim. She's got the iron belly, uh, perk or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, right. I've got the Sims on the mind. We just did a waff about that. All right. Um, yeah. So that is these first three chapters here. Uh, uh, next time we're going to be back talking about, I think, the remainder of Todash. We're going to uh, have the uh, the Katet and the people from Calibre and Sturgis meet. They're going to do their uh, their their bargaining, et cetera. Zach, thank you so much for uh, for for coming along on this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm excited to be able to do it. And I think it's, uh, it's you and me on the next one, too, right? I believe so, yes. All right. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So in, in, in two weeks, um, where can people find you? Oh, they can find me at Zap Jackson on Twitter or, uh, or on on uh, on Steam at West of Loathing, <laughs> uh, our, our video game that's, that's good. Yeah. I think there's probably some Gunslinger reference somewhere. Oh, yeah. At, there's you you find a north central positronic uh reactor what? at some at some point yeah oh man it's, i i totally would have like geeked out about that and shared a screenshot if i saw it yeah it's in the it's in the el vibrato stuff so it's like pretty obscured okay deep deep in there but yeah i think that's as far as it goes i i tried to i tried to lay off so like so many just like overt pop culture references but uh-huh. I, I there are so many just great turns of phrase in this uh in this series in general, mm-hmm. that it's impossible not to. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially when you're, uh, when you're dealing with Western stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I heartily recommend West of Loathing. It was one of my favorite games last year and it's now available on switch and it's super tempting to download that and play it portably. So. Mm. Well, thanks buddy. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you can find me, uh, on other shows here on duckfeed.tv, uh, also on Twitter at, uh, at Cole Ross. And uh, I stream horror games over the weekend um, uh, at our uh, Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash duckfeedtv. Um, I think that's everything. You know the stuff uh, that you can do for all podcasts. Thanks so much for your support on Patreon. Helps me uh, do this as a job. It's nice and fun. But otherwise, please stick around. Tell your friends. We'll see you in two weeks with uh, uh, the next few chapters of this book. Uh, But until then, long days and pleasant nights. 